Greetings to all Masons and students of Masonic history, especially those belonging to the Grand Lodge of Indiana, under whose auspices this series of broadcasts is being made, and what has been termed a world exemplification of Freemasonry. My name is John Wade, and as I record this programme, I'm the Worshipful Master of Quattro Coronati Lodge, number 2076, on the register of the United Grand Lodge of England. No doubt it's because I am the master of this lodge, which has for over a hundred years been known as the premier lodge of Masonic research in the world, that I've been asked to present this first programme on the 1st of January 2011. Let me hasten to say that, while we certainly regard ourselves as being a leading lodge in the field of Masonic research, the term premier is just used, as just used is, of course, in respect of the fact that in 1886, Quattro Coronati Lodge was the first lodge to be founded anywhere devoted to the pursuit of Masonic research. The title given to me by Brother Al McClelland for this programme is The Four Crowned Ones. Clearly, it has been expected that I should explain the meaning behind our lodge's Latin name, and then perhaps to outline what was intended to be achieved by the Quattro Coronati Lodge at its inception to what extent it has achieved the aims of its founders, and what it is doing today, in the 21st century, especially in the light of a renewed interest throughout the craft worldwide in Masonic education. The first word, quatuor, is a less common spelling of the classical Latin word for the number four. At the time of the Roman Empire, it was usually spelled with two Ts. The second word, coronati, means literally having been crowned, and so the two words mean the four crowned ones, as per the title of this programme. So, who were the four crowned ones, and why were these Latin words used as the name of a Masonic lodge of research? Well, we shall need to spend some time on the first of these questions, as the explanation is far from straightforward. The sources that I've used in seeking answers to both questions are the History of the First 100 Years of Quattro Coronati Lodge, number 2076, published in 1986 by Colin Dyer, who was the Worshipful Master of the Lodge in 1975. An essay entitled Santi Quattro Coronati, Bibliography and Iconography, by Renzo Dianigi, the Professor of Surgery at the University of Pavia in Italy, published in 1998, and the monumental complex of Santi Quattro Coronati in Rome by Lia Barelli, Professor of Architectural Restoration at La Sapienza University in Rome, published in 2009. As a member of QC Lodge, and I shall refer to the Lodge by that abbreviated name from now on, it was natural that I should have turned first to Colin Dyer's centenary history, and in any case, his was the earliest of the three printed sources that I've used. After setting the scene for the consecration of the Lodge, within both an outline history of the craft from the earliest sources and the 19th century interest in publishing Masonic journals and attempts to set up Masonic discussion groups, Dyer turns to discussing the name of the Lodge. He states that, quote, The Regius manuscript refers to the craft of a stonemason as Ars Quattro Coronatorum, lines 497 to 534. The lines in question I shall give now in McKay's encyclopedia version, quote, to render them intelligible to modern readers. Pray we now to God Almighty, and to his mother Mary Bright, that we may keep these articles here, and these points well altogether, as did those holy martyrs for, that in this craft were of great honour. They were as good masons as on earth shall go, Gravers and image-makers they were also, for they were workmen of the best. The emperor had them in great liking. He willed of them an image to make, that might be worshipped for his sake. Such idols he had in his day, to turn the people from Christ's law. And to their craft without denial, they loved well God and all his law, and were in his service evermore. True men they were in that same day, and lived well in God's law. They thought no idols for to make, for no good that they might take, 
to believe on that idol for their god, they would not do so, though he were mad, for they would not forsake their true faith and believe on his false law. The emperor caused to take them at once and put them in a deep prison. The sorer he punished them in that place, the more joy was to them of Christ's grace. Then, when he saw no other one, to death he let them then go. Whoso will of their life more know, by the book he may it show. In the legends of the saints, the names of the four crowned ones, their feast will be without denial, after all hallows, the eighth day. If this were the only version of the story, it would be a fairly straightforward development from an account of the martyrdom of four Roman stonemasons for refusing, as Christians, to carve a statue of the emperor for him to be worshipped. The cult of the Quattro Coronati, as the patron saints of the building trade, acquiring the prefix of Santi, meaning holy, developed in Italy, France, Germany, the Netherlands and England, but not in Scotland or Ireland, where the two Saints John seem to have occupied that position. However, when we come to examine the sources for the story, we find that in a manuscript known as the Passio, and dating back to the 6th century AD, there are nine names assigned to two groups of martyrs in the designation the Four Crowned Ones. The first group of five named individuals, and note that is five, not four, consisted of Claudius, Castorius, Sympronianus, Nicostratus and Simplicius. They were stone sculptors who were employed by the Emperor Diocletian in the quarries in Pannonia. That was the Roman province which today covers an area including Hungary and what was until quite recently known as Yugoslavia. The first four of these sculptors were Christians and since they secretly attributed their skill to their Christian faith, they in due course converted a fifth fellow worker, Simplicius, to this faith. He was baptised by Cyril, Bishop of Antioch, who was being kept prisoner in Pannonia. Diocletian first commissioned a statue of the sun god, which the five sculptors completed and were handsomely rewarded for their efforts. However, when the emperor, delighted by their skilled execution of this work, instructed them to carve a statue of Aesculapius, the five were unwilling to do this. Some of their fellow workers had noticed the Christians crossing themselves, and being jealous of the preferment being given to the sculptors by the emperor, fomented religious dispute, and had the sculptors investigated on suspicion of being Christians. Diocletian now assigned their work to other craftsmen, and put the five in the custody of a tribune named Lampadius for him to judge them. Following the sculptor's refusal to venerate the statue of the sun god, they were found guilty of sacrilege and impiety, and sentenced to be flogged to death. But at this point, Lampardius seems to have had a seizure and promptly died. This upset Diocletian, with the result that the five sculptors were now imprisoned alive in lead boxes and thrown into the river where they perished. The second legendary story, which follows that of the Pannonian stonemasons, involves four unnamed Roman soldiers, each of whom held the rank of Cornicularius. Now, a Cornicularius was a senior soldier, below the rank of a centurion, in charge of the records held in the tabularium. These men had refused to sacrifice to the god of healing, Aesculapius, in the Temple of the Baths of Trajan in the city of Rome. They were consequently condemned to death by the Emperor Diocletian. The manner of their death involved being beaten with plumbatae, which were whips having balls of lead at the end of each rope, forming the whip. Their bodies were then hurled to dogs, but the dogs refused to devour them. Five days later, their so far unburied bodies were recovered at night by St. Sebastian and Pope Melchiades, and buried in the cemetery of Santi Marcellino e Pietro on the Via Labicana at the fourth milestone. The date of this martyrdom was a year after the Pannonian incident, and indeed on the anniversary of the deaths of the five sculptors. But since their names were unknown, the Pope decreed that they should be celebrated under the names of the four Pannonian martyrs, Claudius, 
Nicostratus, Sempronianus and Castorius. You will probably have noticed that while I've indicated that both of these legendary stories occurred during the reign of Diocletian, and that was from AD 284 to 305, I have not assigned a particular year to either of them. Most accounts seem to suggest that this was on the 8th of November, but there is little agreement on the years involved, which reign from 287 to 307. Uh, clearly, the latter date must be wrong, since Diocletian abdicated through ill health on the 1st of May 305. Diocletian himself was born in 241, probably in Salona in Dalmatia. Now, that's uh, Solan in modern Croatia. And he became emperor in 284. His persecution of the Christians started, though some scholars think that his co-emperor Galerius took the lead in this, from around 299, and following the Council of Nicomedia in 302, was pursued vigorously. But the really significant factor, so far as concerns the later legend of the four Roman soldiers who were martyred, is that Diocletian was only resident in Rome from the spring of 303, and he left again on the 20th of December of that year. Presumably, it was sometime during those eight months of 303 traditionally, of course, on the 8th of November, that the four canicularii were put to death. If this took place one or two years after the Pannonian incident, the five Pannonian sculptors must have been killed in around 301 or 302. At that time, Diocletian was mainly resident in Antioch. Historically speaking, the few facts have been recorded in the De Positio Martyrum, a 4th century calendar of martyrs. The confusion between these two stories is further complicated by the identification by Pope Leo IV of the four canicularii with the names of four martyrs from the catacombs of Albano, namely Severus, Severianus, Carpophorus and Victorinus. It would seem that this identification was made in order to give the four anonymous canicularii actual names of martyrs. Professor Liabarelli has suggested that, quote, the simplest interpretation of the identity of the crowned martyrs is that they were Roman, perhaps soldiers, buried in the Via Labicana, where a cubiculum is inscribed with the name Clement, probably the first martyr in the De Positio. Her suggested explanation for the conflating of the two legends is that the Pannonian craftsmen, seeking refuge in Rome, following the barbarian incursions into their homeland, brought the cults of their own martyrs with them. The whole matter remains one of speculation. During the early Middle Ages, Pope Leo IV organised a search for the remains of the four soldiers, the five Pannonian sculptors and the martyrs from Albano. He then had them put in the crypt of the church of the Santi Quattro Coronati, thereby ensuring one place for the cult of the Quattro Coronati, whatever their actual names. This church is first recorded as being dedicated to the Quattro Coronati in 595, but this is likely to have occurred much earlier in the 6th century. It's not within the remit of this paper to study the history of this church, or of any other so-named church, but it is important to note the spread of the cult across Europe, and of course the adoption of the four crowned ones as the patron saints of the stonemasons throughout continental Europe. In Germany, the QC maintained some connection with the stonemasons, but this was largely supplanted by St John the Baptist. In Italy and the Netherlands, there was a strong and continuous link with the QC as patron saints, but apart from tenuous connection in Canterbury, and I shall be looking at that a little later, in England, Scotland and Ireland, their role was taken on by the two saints John. There are large numbers of representations in art and sculpture throughout Europe, 
and I've selected a number of these in different countries to illustrate the widespread association of the QC with the stonemason's trade. They are portrayed either as the five Pannonian sculptors or as the four Roman soldiers, although sometimes Simplicius is missing from the Pannonian group, or given a less prominent position, in order to keep the number of the martyrs consistent with their accepted titular designation. Renato Dionigi, in his comprehensive survey of the iconography of the QC, has demonstrated that their representation with the tools of the stonemasons is the main cause of the spread of their worship all over Europe, and that, in times when the arts and their guilds are particularly relevant in town life, the representations of the QC become more frequent, but when they lose importance, such celebrations suddenly disappear. I'm picking out four examples he has cited to give you some idea of the way in which the QC have been depicted across Europe and over a wide chronological span. The first is one of the earliest representations of the QC and is to be found on, a, on folio 231 of the Vitae Sanctorum, the Lives of the Saints, in a Spanish picture bible of 1197. Originally printed for the King of Navarre, and now in the Bibliothèque de la Ville in Amiens, France. Here the QC are shown being flogged by the plumbatae beside the statue of the god that they refuse to venerate. Note the Latin term simulacrum, statue, above the figure on the right. An early Italian example of the QC can be seen in Pavia at the church of San Pietro in Cieldoro on the side of St Augustine's Ark. Here are four sculptures by Bonino da Campione depicting the QC with their tools. The third, and probably the most famous sculpture of the QC, is the group carved in Florence in the early 15th century by Nanni de Banco. This group, considered to be de Banco's finest work, depicts the four martyrs dressed in Roman togas and with their heads displaying many of the features of the great busts of classical art. For the fourth representation, I have a short piece of film that I shot in the church of the Santi Quattro Coronati on a spur of the Caelian Hill in Rome. This church dates from the 5th century and underwent many modifications throughout the ensuing centuries. The chapel of Sylvester was constructed in the 13th century and there is a depiction of the martyrdom of the four Roman soldiers on the north side of the presbytery, attributed to Raffaellino da Reggio. In the church itself is a magnificent apse. Its interior wall is divided into panels separated by pilasters of the Corinthian order, and each of these panels contains a scene taken from the stories of the two groups of martyrs. The frescoes were painted by Giovanni da San Giovanni in the early 17th century. It was the devout refusal of these stonemasons to use their skills to the glory of pagan iconography that cost them their lives, and that same devotion led to their being adopted as the patron saints of the medieval operative masons. In Italy, the craftsmen working in the Lombard and other guilds held the four crowned martyrs in particular honour, and the most famous schools of the masons' operative craft in Milan, Rome and Venice were named after them. This tradition spread across Europe, and we've seen some examples of their representations, and their presence is attested in Spain, Germany, France, the Netherlands and England. I should comment on the single example we have for England. According to Bede in the early 7th century, there was a church in Canterbury dedicated to the QC, which probably contained relics of them, but this was destroyed by fire in 619. Dionigi questions whether there was actually a church with this dedication. He points out that B generally uses the Latin word ecclesia for a church, but in this passage uses the word martyrium, which could be translated as church, tomb or chapel. In his opinion, it was more likely that there was a chapel dedicated to the QC within a church whose name we do not know. Certainly there was no tradition of the QC as patron saints of the stonemasons in England. Nevertheless, this did not prevent the founders of Quattua Coronati Lodge in having the lodge consecrated with this name in January 1886 
at Freemasons Hall in London. The first draft of the petition to form the lodge included these words. The lodge is founded in commemoration of the Quattuor Coronati, or Four Crowned Martyrs, stated to have been Masons, and referred to in our earliest Masonic manuscript. Today, Freemasons Hall, a later building than that in which the consecration took place, is still the meeting place of the lodge, numbered 2076, on the register of the United Grand Lodge of England. It meets five times a year in February, May, June, September and November. The November meeting on the second Thursday of that month is celebrated as the Feast of the Four Crown Martyrs and is the occasion of the annual installation of the new master. Sometimes we have the good fortune of this occurring on the actual day in the calendar of the saints, the 8th of November. The objectives attributed to the founders of our lodge have been summarised at the start of each edition of AQC, that's Ars Quattuor Coronatorum, the transactions of the lodge, since 1976, namely to imbue brethren everywhere with a love of research, to encourage the study of all facets of Freemasonry, to read papers in the lodge and to encourage criticism and discussion on them, to attract the attention and to enlist the cooperation of Masonic scholars in all parts of the world. Naturally, our Victorian founders were rather more verbose about their intentions. In his oration delivered at the consecration of Quattro Coronati Lodge in 1886, the Reverend Adolphus F. A. Woodford, past Grand Chaplain, said, In this, our new lodge, it is proposed, from time to time, to have papers read on subjects far off or near, recondite or commonplace, to invite discussion on the successive subjects brought before us by expert workmen, and to issue transactions. We trust that by this means we may help forward the important cause of Masonic study and investigation. But sure I am of this, that this new venture has been essayed in an honest attachment to the craft, and in a sincere desire usefully to extend the many claims Masonic history and archaeology have on our time, our intellects and our sympathy, as Freemasons who take a pride in their order, and who feel and feel strongly that knowledge and light, the opposites of ignorance and darkness, are, ever have been, and we trust ever will be, characteristic features and the abiding distinction of Freemasonry. As early as 1888, the third master, Brother Simpson, made reference to the custom of members asking questions. Before the end of the year, the first volume of our transactions will be out, and it will be in itself an evidence of the character of those who belong to the lodge. It will at least show that almost everyone is fitted to take part in the discussion of the difficult questions which are brought before us, and that they are competent to do so with credit to themselves. The questioning of those presenting papers and the subsequent recording of those questions and the responses from the speaker have been, for many, one of the most important aspects of the way that Masonic debate has been conducted in the Lodge since its foundation. Our founders worked for a study of Freemasonry based on contemporary records and how those studies are still being advanced today. In the early days of QC Lodge, the Freemason magazine carried reports of notable discoveries by W. J. Hewan in the archives of Scottish lodges, which transformed our understanding of Freemasonry in the 16th and 17th centuries. Robert Freak Gould devoted himself to a systematic exploration of newspaper literature of the late 17th and early 18th centuries. Towards the end of his life, Gould published a detailed account of the periodicals he had checked, and he urged others to take his work forward into periodicals of the later 18th century. It is pleasing that this sort of work is being continued by current members of QC Lodge. In the 1930s and 40s, a very important figure emerged in the study of Masonic history. This was Douglas Noop, Professor of Economics in the University of Sheffield. Noop was initiated into University Lodge, Sheffield, number 3911, in 1921. 
joined the Quattro Coronati Correspondence Circle in 1928 and gave his first paper in 1929. He was elected a full member of the Lodge in 1931 and became the Master in 1935. Noop embodied both the academic and Masonic traditions of research and, together with Gwilym Jones and Douglas Hamer from Manchester and Sheffield Universities respectively, produced a number of books and articles which remain vitally important for the study of British Freemasonry. These three scholars, only one of whom was a Mason, have been referred to as the Sheffield School of Masonic Research. That school was revived in the foundation some 50 years after the death of Noop of the Centre for Research into Freemasonry at the University of Sheffield in 1999. That centre, which was the first centre devoted to scholarly research into Freemasonry to be established in Britain, over the last 10 years developed links with numerous research organisations, libraries, grand lodges, provincial grand lodges, private lodges and individual masons, producing a good number of papers, publishing the William Preston Illustrations of Masonry CD with its comparative versions of nine editions, creating an online version of John Lane's Masonic Records and so on. Unfortunately, with effect from the 1st of January 2010, the activities of the Centre for Research into Freemasonry Fraternalism were, in the words of a statement from the University of Sheffield, suspended for the time being. This news, which has broken during the last few months, is very disappointing, but it's hardly surprising in an age where funding in universities is getting very tight. I sincerely hope that, having been able to secure the large collection of Masonic books acquired by the Centre over the last ten years at the local Masonic Hall in Sheffield, with the approval of the University of Sheffield, there could be a time in the future when the Centre would be able to reopen with new funding. In the meantime, the Library of Books continues to be readily accessible to Masonic scholars at Tapton Hall in Sheffield. Professor Andrew Prescott, in an address given while he was director of the centre, said that academic research into Freemasonry must seek to use the study of Masonic sources to address themes of scholarly concern. It was indeed this kind of approach which was so well used by Noop and Jones, and which related the study of Freemasonry to current scholarly debates, and made use of the latest scholarly techniques to investigate their subject. Prescott went on to say that Rather than continuing to plod along in the antiquarian and positivistic traditions established in the early years, years of Quattro Coronati Lodge, Noop and Jones, in investigating the medieval mason, used the latest cutting-edge techniques of economic history and produced a work whose originality startled academic reviewers. It is perhaps significant that Noop's views were not always well received, and indeed, his last paper on James Anderson was not published by QC Lodge for fear of causing offence. However, from the 1950s, QC scholars such as Harry Carr argued that the aim of their work should be to help the ordinary Freemason to understand their craft. This tendency was reinforced by the need to maintain the membership of the Correspondence Circle in order to finance QC publications. In this context, it was felt that the questions debated by academic historians were of little interest to ordinary Masons, and they ceased to be debated. Thus it was that, in this post-war period, of Masonic historians had moved away from what was of interest to academic historians, and had become preoccupied with debates as to the character and improvement of Freemasonry. Yet we have already seen that the experience of Gould, Hewan and other early Masonic scholars suggests that an engagement with academic history can be valuable for those members of a particular organisation concerned with its history. But in doing so, academic historians perhaps need to abandon some of the sweeping claims they make for the wider intellectual aspects of their subject and return to basics. Where academic historians can make common cause with Masonic scholars is in the exploration of primary materials, and it was this systematic search for primary sources that was so vital in Gould's era. One of the yardsticks for measuring the success of QC Lodge is the growth of the Correspondence Circle, which was formed during the first year of the Lodge's existence. 
The attendances grew from the single figures at the first few meetings to over a hundred on occasions by 1897. As early as 1890, overseas brethren were joining the correspondence circle and attending the lodge meetings. AQC first appeared in 1888 and has been published each year thereafter. Membership of the Correspondence Circle grew steadily from 179 in 1887 to nearly 3,000 in 1901. The two wars, however, took their toll and the membership total dropped to 1,772 in 1942. It rose again to over 2,500 by the end of 1951. 5,000 in 1962, 10,000 in 1970, and at the time of Dyer's history in 1986, the numbers had passed 13,000. This huge increase in correspondence circle membership in post-war years, while showing that interest in Masonic history and research was at a high level, brought problems associated with the commercial activities of the Lodge, and this led to the formation of the company QCCC Limited in 1974. During the 23 years since the centenary, the Lodge and the company have been faced with a number of challenges, some of which have been met, others sadly have only been partially met, or not at all. The biggest and most important issue is the membership of the Correspondence Circle, which has fallen in that time to its current level of 5,400, a loss of some 58% of the members. It is not that the Correspondence Circle was failing so much as it was being subjected to the underlying trend in the total number of Freemasons. The number of Masons on the Register of the United Grand Lodge of England peaked around 1960. Membership of QC clearly peaked a little later than that date, which is perhaps not surprising. It was agreed that the primary focus of the Lodge is the production of the intellectual property of the Lodge, AQC. When QC Lodge was founded, the main intention of the Lodge was to publish an annual journal, Ars Quatuor Coronatorum, AQC. The intention of the founder members was to establish a means of communicating the latest Masonic research to members of the Order across the world. At that time, more than a hundred years ago, this was a brilliant step forward for the craft in general. Today the situation has changed quite radically. Research into Freemasonry is now pursued by a large number of organisations around the world, Masonic and non-Masonic, and the results are published in books, journals and on the web. In past decades, it was probably fair to say that AQC had the widest circulation in Masonic research. That is no longer true. Herodom has a list of subscribers rapidly approaching that of the QC Correspondence Circle at 4,700. The Pietra Stones Library has a huge number of papers by some of the best authors and the Grand Lodge of British Columbia and the Yukon has an excellent library of papers from the best research sources, including some of our own papers. This is where the world exemplification of Freemasonry comes into the equation. Brother Al McClellan's inspired idea of not only bringing together in a database a large number of papers from Masonic scholars across the globe, but also storing for all times the delivery of those papers by their authors in an audio-visual medium is a very far-reaching and perceptive innovation in the field of Masonic research. As he often likes to say, wouldn't it have been wonderful to have been able to watch and hear Albert Pike deliver a paper? Thank you all for watching and listening to this first paper in the World Exemplification of Freemasonry series. It has been my privilege and pleasure to set the scene for this history of the craft worldwide, starting with the Four Crown Points. Thank you.